My name is Des Lally and on behalf of Clifton Community Arts Festival I'd like to welcome all our viewers and in particular I'd like to welcome Colin McCann who will be reading from his Booker Prize nominated novel A Pyragon. Colin attended the 2019 festival in Clifton uh, and read from his novel and we're thrilled that once again Colm uh, has via a transatlantic web feed uh, given us the opportunity to hear him read and speak more about this magnificent work. Hi, Colm McCann here. Um, I hope you're well in Clifton. Uh, I'm here in uh, New York. Um, I wish I was there in Clifton right now. Um, and uh, you know, a large part of me always is in Clifton. Uh, I mean, not only was I there last year for the, for the festival, uh, but I've been there many times before. Um, in fact, I used to go to Clifton on uh, holidays as a kid uh, from coming down from Dublin. Uh, we'd go to Clifton. Sometimes we'd go to Liston and Varna, sometimes we'd go to Acco, but we'd always go out west. Seems like a lot of young Irish people are going to staying within Ireland these days on their holidays, uh, which is a, an unusual thing. But when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s, of course, it wasn't an unusual thing, but Clifton was a glory for me. Um, I also visited Clifton to um, research my novel, uh, Transatlantic, which takes the flight of uh, Alcock and Brown um, as uh, one of its fundamental images. Um, and uh, I got to read from uh, Transatlantic uh, when I was there last year, but I also got to read from um, A Paragon, which I think was the uh, it was certainly was the first reading uh, in Ireland, but it might have been the first reading that I did anywhere uh, from my new novel, um, A Paragon, which I'm going to uh, talk about and, um, and maybe read a little bit from today, this morning. Um, but um, thank you to everybody at the Clifton Arts Festival uh, for this opportunity to sort of reach across um, into your computers and into your homes, these strange moments which... Um, have sort of redefined the way we tell stories and the way we talk to one another. Um, and, um, you know, I've been doing this for a few months now, the, 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 the Zoom notion. And um, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I hope it works. I don't want it to last forever. I would love to be getting invited back to Clifton um, this time next year. So please, uh, if we're all COVID free or when we're all COVID free, Let's be optimistic here. Um, let's uh, let's try and get back together again. So, um, thank you for um, for giving me this chance. Um, a paragon. Uh, so I'll give you the background to the book. Um, after writing Transatlantic, um, which is largely about the uh, Irish peace process, um, I, uh, I I began to think a little bit about um, the Middle East. Um, I talked to various people who had been involved in the in 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 um, the Middle East in various ways, um, and I suppose we write towards our obsessions. And um, one of the things that I was interested in was, um, you know, how the peace process had been successful. And I know it's shaky, and I know it's difficult, um, in in Ireland, uh, but uh, never really took uh, hold, um, or hasn't yet taken hold. Um, in the Middle East, and what 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 was different about everything uh, that is going on um, over in the in Palestine and Israel and the what they call the Holy Land? Um, I went with Narrative Four, which is a story exchange group, a global story exchange group for young people, actually headquartered in uh, Limerick, um, and uh, a group of activists and artists went over. And we toured around um, uh, Palestine and Israel, uh, an extraordinary trip um, and seeing all facets and um, sides uh, of uh, what was going on. Uh, on the second to last day, going to this town in um, called Beit Jala, which is near Jerusalem, near uh, Bethlehem, and up these rickety stairs into an office where these two men are sitting there. One is named Rami, the other is named Bassam. And um, they began to tell their stories and within a couple of seconds, all the oxygen was gone from the air for me. Uh, I was completely taken by uh, what they were saying. They were telling the stories of how they had lost their, uh, their daughters 
a beer and some madar. And um, really my heart was cleaved entirely open by the stories of these men who had decided to use the force of their grief as a weapon for peace uh, around the world or as a weapon for engagement. And um, they say that, uh, you know, we had, it will not be over until we talk. It will not be over until we fundamentally uh, begin to understand one another. Uh, that is not everything, but it is the building block upon which things uh, get created. Um, and I came back to uh, New York. I tried to work on, another, on a different novel, to be honest with you, and um, it wasn't working. Um, and I kept coming back to the idea of these two men. And so I sort of... Um, uh, you know, decided that this was the thing that I wanted to try to devote um, some of my time to because it um, it haunted me. And as I say, we write towards uh, our obsessions. And I got to know uh, Rami and Bassam. I went over to Israel and Palestine about, uh, I don't know, close to a dozen times. Um, and they became and are uh, my, among my best friends. Um, the book uh, is a hybrid novel uh, and it's sort of... Um, well, it, uh, it 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 takes as its central characters uh, the um, uh, you know Rami and Bassam, who are real life figures, but it also creates fictions um, around them. And um, a lot of people ask me, well, what's fiction and what's not fiction? And I'm I, I'm not sure. I doubt. I I, I kind of doubt the, the the word fiction. Um, fiction means to shape, uh, but also nonfiction shapes in the in the in the same sort of way. And I like the idea of storytelling. Storytelling from the heart. Um, that I think the deepest texture of honesty comes uh, when we engage, uh, you know, from from the heart. And uh, one of the things that was interesting to me about the uh, situation uh, over there was that how confusing um, it was to me. In a similar way that Northern Ireland was confusing to me as a child, and maybe Northern Ireland still is confusing to me, and certainly Israel and Palestine still is confusing to me. One of the um, the things that I talk about these days is, um, you know, the value of those um, three words, uh, I am confused or I don't know. Uh, increasingly, we're unprepared to say these these words because we're, we're, we're sort of so many of us and mea culpa, you know, live our lives diseased with certainty. We have to be in a particular box. We have to think one way. We have to vote one way. We have to appear one way when the truth is uh, rather messy and complicated. Um, and one of the beautiful things about engaging with Rami and Bassam's story was the idea that um, that this truth of theirs could be messy and complicated um, uh, for me. Uh, and I can embrace those contradictions, the Whitman-esque idea of like, I am large, I contain multitudes. Uh, Whitman says in, that, in Leaves of Grass, do I contradict myself? Very well then, I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes. And I think the multitudinous aspect um, of our character, especially in America today, um, is being uh, denied. Uh, perhaps not so much in Irish politics, which seems to come uh, you know, from a much stronger place and, and, and an ability to, to talk through these things and perhaps to hold contradictory notions at the same time. But um, no, that was one of the fundamental uh, tenets of the of of the novel. And if you you know if if you read the book, um, maybe you get a little confused in the first um, twenty twenty five pages. And that's exactly what I kind of wanted uh, for the uh, to happen to the reader, because it's all this stuff about bird migration and patterns, and then uh, you know there's war uh, analogies and talk about Francois Mitterrand's last meal. Um, and when I gave this book to my son, who was um, you know, 17 at the time, and he's a very strong reader, he's actually in New York right now reading Finnegan's Wake. Um, and, um, but at the time he was 17 and, and he started reading it for me. He said, Dad, I'm confused. And then he, he sort of said, I surrendered myself to the confusion. And then I began to understand the beating heart of the book, which is kind of what I wanted. Because I want the story of Rami and Bassam to be there. I want the story of Abir and Smadar to be there, to be part of uh, the music of, 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 of what happens. Now, um, you know, I'm very aware that I'm, you know, a white middle-aged man, you know, living in America, an Irishman, and, and um, you know, so what sort of right do I have to go into um, this, this sort of territory? And it was a big question for me. 
and and you know there's fundamental questions going on these days about cultural appropriation which are wonderful and 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 god bless the people who who, who are bringing these up and 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 and, and asking these questions because they're right because for, for 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 decades for years for centuries even uh, you know we have been culturally appropriating in different ways whether we be corporations whether we be governments whether we be uh, be uh, artists um, going in and stereotyping and condescending and patronizing and yes plundering um, and, and and for all the wrong reasons um, and um, so this exists and, 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 and I'm highly 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 conscious of it but I'm also highly conscious that within the exact same argument is the idea of um, cultural celebration um, that we go in with our head bowed, that we go in with humility, that we go in with um, a, a certain amount of knowing that um, uh, we uh, are confused or we are ignorant even um, and we want to expand ourselves by going into new territory. I think as Irish people we know that a lot, we go, we, we go a lot of places and we're curious and we engage with other cultures. Um, and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to go in with as much humility um, as I could and, uh, and and talk about these um, people. So cultural celebration as opposed to um, uh, cultural appropriation. Now, Rami and Bassam, who I hope you can invite uh, to Clifton uh, next year, um, you know, they allowed me to do, I, I said, I'm going to write a novel. And, 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 and they said, OK, fair enough. Um, and they allowed me to do what I wanted to do. No, but but essentially i think they know um that the the, um, the book is honest to their experience um and you know they've been very gen generous very kind uh rami read it cover to cover to cover um and uh, i said extraordinary things about it but sam can't read it which is great too in the sense that 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 um i understand that he said it's too painful uh for him to to read or to relive some of the experiences um of his life um but they've both been 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 extraordinary in in um, allowing this um this story to get out into the world and i believe the story has to get out into the world just like the story of northern ireland has to get out into the world i think that one of the great stories of the, the, the 20th century and maybe even the 21st century is our own peace process and our own engagement with um ideas of uh, uh dialogue ideas of belonging ideas of reconciliation or even non-reconciliation, um, ideas of forgiveness, uh, ideas of justice. And um, so I think in many ways, uh, growing up in Dublin uh, helped me, but in particular, with my mum is from Garva uh, in Derry, and I spent my summers in Derry um, in, the, in, in a farm in Garva and with a lot of cousins who were um in the neighborhood and i understood checkpoints and i understood violation and i understood some of the the stuff about you know political appropriation and and and, and hatred and lies and half lies and and these sort of things so it, um i think in a certain to a certain extent being irish helped me get through uh you know some of uh you know this engagement with the uh, with the the um the palestinian uh experience in particular um and i gotta tell you that when i went to, to, to israel and palestine the uh the, the the hospitality there was absolutely extraordinary i know we pride ourselves in, in ireland on on, on, uh, on our hospitality and yes it's true but if you go to beit sahur or if you go to Beit Jala and, 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 and places like that, and you meet these young Palestinian people who sort of invite you into their village, invite you into their homes, they cook for you, uh, they, they want you to meet their extended families, they want you to experience their world. Um, it's pretty extraordinary. In Israel too, I, I met some, some of the most fascinating people. Um, and, 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 and uh, you know, the, not fitting in with any of the, the cultural norms. As a writer, I want to scuff up some of the stereotypes um, that we receive all the time. Um, if you take the imaginative capital that's apparent in, 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 in amongst the young people in Ramallah, in, in, for, for instance, in the West Bank, they would be top of the Forbes list in terms of imaginative capital. Um, 
and grace and style. It's really, uh, it's really quite wonderful. Uh, we perceive, uh, or, or certainly maybe I did, or we tended to perceive Palestinians in a certain way and tended to perceive uh, Israelis in a certain way. And it's much more complicated uh, than that. Nothing became more apparent uh, than, uh, you know, embracing the complications uh, of Rami and Bassam and their families. Now, the book is called A Paragon. Uh, the title comes from, um, I know, so I'm sorry, the title's weird. Uh, and my publishers were, at first, were going, like, you're going to write about Israel and Palestine? And you're going to call it a word that nobody knows? Uh, and um, God bless them, they, 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 they went with it. But uh, I had to fight for it for, for, for quite a while. Um, but uh, the paragon is a shape with a countably infinite number of sides. And what I was trying to say there, that it's not so complicated that you can't understand it. Uh, what I'm trying to say is we're all part of the shape. We're all there. We're all there in uh, Jerusalem. We're all there in Bethlehem. We're all part of Abir's story. We're all part of Smadar's story. Um, Abir gets killed with a rubber bullet in the back of the head. Um, uh, Smadar is killed in a suicide bombing. Um, and, um, you know, uh, in many ways, you know, we can turn a blind eye to these sort of things. Oh, you know, it's over there. Uh, it's far away from us. But really, no, it's not. Uh, you know, every atom belonging to me as good as belongs to you. Um, and so what happens in Jerusalem really happens to to all of us. Um, the metaphor I use for this is um, bird migration and bird patterns and birds coming from Ireland and birds coming from South Africa, Sweden, Mali, Algeria, and coming on this flight pattern across this um, um, Israel and Palestine, um, uh, sort of taking away borders, taking away boundaries, being dismissive of these things, these, these, these uh, birds having these, these gorgeous flight patterns um, in the air. And what I wanted to say is that we're all involved, we're all complicit. Uh, it's all part of our, our own story. And I'm going to read you the section that's in the middle of the book. This, the book is written in 1,001 different, what I call cantos, little sections. Uh, and it goes from 1 to 500, and then from 500 down to 1, so that the novel could almost be read uh, backwards. And in the middle sits um, this particular um, section, which really gives away the plot of the, the, the whole novel, uh, but gives away nothing at the same time. So, um, thinking of being there uh, in Clifton and seeing you all and um, being having a chance to read maybe next year or the year after. So section 1001 from A Paragon. Once upon a time and not so long ago and not so far away, Rami Elhanan, an Israeli, a Jew, a graphic artist, husband of Nurit, father of Elik and Guy and Yigal, father too of the late Smadar, Travel on his motorbike from the suburbs of Jerusalem to the Kremazan Monastery in the mainly Christian town of Beit Jala, near Bethlehem, in the Judean hills, to meet with Bassam Aramin, a Palestinian, a Muslim, a former prisoner, an activist, born near Hebron, husband of Salwa, father of Arab and Arin and Muhammad and Ahmed and Hiba, father too of the late Abir, ten years old, shot dead by an unnamed Israeli border guard in East Jerusalem almost a decade after Rami's daughter Smadar, two weeks away from 14, was killed in the western part of the city by three Palestinian suicide bombers, Bashar Sawala, Yusef Shuli and Tofik Yassin from the village of Asira al-Shamalia near Nablus in the West Bank, a place of intrigue to the listeners gathered in the red brick monastery perched on the hillside in the mountains of the beloved, by the terraced vineyard in the shadow of the wall, having come from a, as far apart as Belfast and Kyushu, Paris and North Carolina, Santiago and Brooklyn, Copenhagen and Terezin, on an ordinary day at the end of October, Foggy, tinged with cold, to listen to the stories of Bassam and Rami, to find within their stories another story, a song of songs, discovering themselves, you and me, in the stone-tiled chapel, where we sit for hours, eager, hopeless, buoyed, confused, cynical, complicit, silent. Our memories imploding, our synapses skipping in the gathering dark, remembering while listening, 
all of those stories that are yet to be told. That's um, section 1001. And uh, yes, I suppose the book is, is, is about all those stories that are yet to be told. Um, and one of the stories that are yet to be told is the story of hope. Um, you know, bizarrely, I suppose, uh, Bassam and Rami are two of the most hopeful men I've ever met in my life. They've suffered so acutely. Uh, they've paid the ultimate price. And yet they somehow believe that, um, you know, they must go around, they must tell the story over and over again uh, in order to educate people because they believe that that, that, that that things can happen, that walls can fall, that the Berlin Wall can come down, that, you know, we can have a peace agreement on Good Friday, that something can happen uh, where they happen to be. And sometimes it happens in the, in, in the flick of an eye and they believe that something will come from underneath you know, something random, something crowdsourced, something that comes from young people, perhaps, something to do with storytelling, perhaps, uh, but that this world will change um, and, that, that, and that it must change. And even if it doesn't, you still have to do what you have to do. Um, the force of faith comes through, um, you know, having the ability to risk yourself. Uh, you know, Rami and Bassam, they risk humiliation. They risk sentiment. They risk getting called names. They risk all these things. For me, that was a minor form of writing this book. I risked a lot. Um, I knew I was going to get a lot of flack for it. And, um, uh, and I knew I was heading into difficult territory. Um, but, you know, nothing compares to uh, what I had to do um, or, 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 or what Rami and Bassam, um, you know, have done. Uh, all their lives, which is shoulder uh, this incredible burden. Um, as I was speaking, I, uh, my mind flicked onto the um, uh, Sinead O'Connor song, Nothing Compares to You. It was um, one of Smadar's f favorite songs, and I actually mention it um, in the book. I saw this amazing video on the Late Late Show um, last year where um, Sinead uh, actually sang the song wearing a hijab. Um, and it was one of those moments of spectacular um, connection um, when I just thought, wow, that is really quite extraordinary. Um, and if you haven't seen it yet, I think you can um, you can uh, get a video of it on, on, on YouTube. Um, talking of videos, talking of films, um, the book has sold, yes. Uh, and um, it's been adapted right now by Luke Davies, the Australian... Um, uh, writer who wrote um, uh, Beautiful Boy and Lion. Um, it's taken by Amblin Studios and Steven Spielberg. And, um, you know, the families are involved. The, the Aramin family, the El Hanan family um, are going to be involved with, um, you know, advising on the film and, 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 and hopefully uh, the message, which is that simple message that Rami and Bassam have of that we must know each other, we must talk to each other, uh, will get out. Um, even further. Um, but nothing is simple, as we know, especially simplification. You know, I'm not going to talk to you about one state, two state, eight states, you know, federation, confederation, all this stuff is still difficult for me. I don't have uh, any of the answers. I don't presume to have uh, any of the answers. What I do have is a sort of um, a glimpse into the territory of the human heart by looking at uh, Rami and Bassam. They were the ones who allowed me to do this. They were the ones um, who gave me this uh, story. And, um, you know, I just feel sort of uh, privileged to have been, um, you know, a small part of uh, what I feel is kind of a, a movement, a political movement. I've had extraordinary um, uh, response from Ireland and, from young people in particular, like 15 year olds in Wexford who are writing me notes about, you know, what the novel meant to them. And um, and I, I'm deeply, deeply grateful for that. Of all the books I've ever written, I think this is the one I will live with the, um, the, the longest. In other words, it will be around for me uh, years and years and years to come. Um, do I know what's next? No. <laughs> I was working on something which was kind of COVID related, but um, like COVID was started hanging on too long and uh, I was hanging on too long and I sort of have abandoned it. I have other ideas um, and perhaps I'll come back to, 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 to Clifton um, at some stage. 
And um, I wanted to read, uh, to finish out with um, another, just a very short reading from uh, one of the passages um, about uh, Bassam. And, and I read around in various uh, parts of the book, um, you know, uh, and, and, and so I'm not always, I don't always um, end up at, this, at the same part, but this is where um, Bassam um, goes to England and he gets stopped in the um, uh, in the airport first before he goes. State your name, Bassam Aramin, from Hebron, age forty two. Who are you travelling with? My wife and children. Destination, England. Where in England? Bradford. Never heard of it. It's a university. What's your purpose? To go to university. Are you trying to be smart with me? No. Where'd you get this permit? I explained that to the other officers. Do I look like the other officers? From the office in Jerusalem. What's your purpose in going to university? To study. Are you a professor? No. How old are you? 42, I told you. And you're studying? Yes. Where did you go to school? The village in Sair. Where's that? Near Hebron, Al Khalil. Did you finish school? My studies were interrupted. What does that mean, interrupted? I didn't finish school, no. Why are you smiling? I always smile, it's part of what I do. I like to smile. Do you want to miss another plane, Bassam? No. Then wipe that grin off your face and tell me, where did you learn Hebrew? After school. After school, is that so? Yes. I have your file here. I know who you are. Then why did you ask? Don't be a smart ass. Answer the question. After school, I learned it. After school, then I worked for the authority, first in sports, then in archives, then I was accepted into the program at Bradford. I have a special permit. I have the right to go there. Answer my question. Why are you going to university now? I was offered a place. You do like that smile of yours, don't you? Not especially. State your name again. Why? I said state your name again. Do you hear me? Are you listening? Bassam Aramin. 25 years without studying and all of a sudden, Bassam Aramin, you're an intellectual. I never said that. I'm going as a student. You're going for how long? A year. The permit is for two years. Yes. And you're going to study what? The Shoah. Pardon me? The Holocaust. I heard you, you're studying the Shoah. You're an Arab, you're a Muslim, you're a terrorist, seven years in prison. You attack us, you throw grenades, you terrorize us, and now you're studying the Shoah. You say you're an intellectual. Is this some sort of joke, Bassam? What, you think I am stupid? I don't think you're stupid at all. Is that what you're telling me? You're going to England so you can tell us how the Shoah didn't happen? No. What do you mean, no? One of the things I have learned is that nobody wants to be expelled from history. What the hell are you talking about? I'm not interested in denying the truth. Is that so? I don't believe in violence of any sort. Since when? Since a long time ago. Really? Yes. How many terrorists are you going to be meeting in Bradford, Bassam? I don't know. What's a terrorist? Can you define it for me? You're asking me? My wife is waiting. My children are waiting. We're going to miss another plane. And I have to say that I'm a little terrified right now, yes. Oh, you're a real smart ass, Bassam, aren't you? I don't think so. Don't smile. I'm not smiling, I'm not laughing, I'm not doing anything. I'm just sitting here answering your questions, waiting for my plane. State your name. I gave it a dozen times already. Name. Bassam Aramin. 
Is that your child crying? I can't see through walls. Why is she crying, Bassam? I don't know. Probably because she's tired. We've been waiting a long time. Can't your wife shut her up? My wife is tired too. We've been here for eight hours. I don't know how many flights we've missed. How many children do you have, Bassam? Five. I used to have six. And later he goes and he studies in, in Bradford and um, he actually comes to Ireland uh, and they've been to Ireland uh, pretty often. They've been in particular to um, uh, the reconciliation centres up north um, and in Belfast. Um, and, um, you know, this message goes on for um, a long, long time. They're part of the parent circle. Um, and they're starting their own foundation called the Abir Smadar Foundation, uh, which would be wonderful if um, everybody sort of contributed it to. And um, my own nonprofit is called uh, Narrative Four, where we can get young people to tell stories across the divides. Um, and I want to thank you um, for giving me a chance to appear as a part of the Clifton Arts Festival. Um, you guys are amazing. You've been doing it for many, 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 many years, Brendan and the crew, and I know how much work goes into it. Um, you are deeply appreciated. It's one of the great festivals in the world. And um, I hope to be back. So uh, thank you for your time. And uh, I will see you sometime soon. Uh, with all best wishes, a paragonally. Thank you. <laughs>